let's hark back now to a time when politicians were more dignified and respectable. Yes, it's time for this week's extra special guest. I'm delighted to welcome Mr John Prescott. 40 years in Parliament. A decade as Deputy Prime Minister. A life peer in the House of Lords. Failed his 11 plus. Punched a Welshman in the gob. John Prescott. Welcome, uh, John. Do I call you John? Baron, Lord Prescott? Now, I know we're getting to the Christmas season, but it's not Baron, it's John, yeah. John, OK, John, uh, uh, it's great to have you here. Um, now, we were obviously talking just, just then about the uh, incident in Parliament yesterday. Would you say that little red book business that John McDonnell, who presumably you've known for many years, that stunt he pulled, is that one of the stupidest things you've ever seen done it's, in the House? It's certainly stupid. <laughs> I think it's next to the guy that left a little note in the, in the drawer that says <laughs> yeah. that there's no more money left. Yeah. We do some daft things. Yeah. How do things like that happen? <laughs> because we have these ideas that you're surrounded by advisers and everything's so well choreographed, and that's one of the reasons that people are cynical about politics. But in some ways, when you see something that dumb happen, it makes us think, oh, no, they're just making it up as they go along. Well, when I sort of couldn't believe it, it pulls out of his pocket, and I thought it was his, one of his stunts, and threw it on the table. So when I saw Osborne a couple of uh, hours ago, I said, what was on the message on that? And he said, warm wishes. I think, thank God he hadn't got the name of somebody to make it even worse on it. Mal couldn't have signed it. He was dead, wasn't he? So, but at least it was the book about that. Um, it's a funny old business in your party at the moment. Um, it's I not I funny, it. I can tell you that. Uh, is the party basically screwed forever and whose fault is it? No, it's not screwed forever. I mean, we go through some difficult periods, but uh, I think there's got to be some changes along the way. So, uh, Jeremy Corbyn... Again, someone who you've known for a long time, someone who you nominated for the leadership? No, I didn't have a nomination in the you... Lords, but what I did say to people, there were many in the PLP who didn't want him to be on the list. Yes. And I said, it's quite wrong. It's one member, one vote, within an MP, an ordinary member. And the ordinary members should make the choice. Mm. But I did say to Jeremy, I, he, he thanked me for encouraging people to put him on the list. I said, Jeremy, I've done that, but I wouldn't vote for your leader. I didn't know I was going to become the leader. But... <laughs> <laughs> he must have felt very silly. Me? Yeah. Well, I played the part, but I thought it was right for the party to make the decision about the, not the leader. Not the kind of elite MPs deciding who should go on the list or not. And what We've have got we learned? One member, one what vote. have we learned? Leave it to the elite MPs, because the party don't know what they're doing. No, hang on. The elite MPs didn't make the decision, did they? I know. But it was the if, party had that they made done, it. Ordinary you might members. Have... Had they made the decision, you might now have a leader who knows his ass from his elbow. Well, I, to my mind, it was a simple question. I've been very much involved in being one member, one vote. There was too much elitism in the Labour Party, and I, the party had been given the right, the members, to vote. It's for them to make the decision. I actually believe that. Now, does that mean your belief is no more for it because you've got Jeremy? I was hoping to begin with, Jeremy was beginning to make a change. You put a tea on, tie on, you know, that was a step forward. Nice. Then a white bow on, that was another step forward, wasn't it? But he was beginning to make some changes. And you don't know what a leader is like until they get into it. And after all, it's only been there about 12 weeks. He has mm. changed things a bit, hasn't he? What's going to happen to him? Is he going to see out the full term to the next election? Um, I often wondered whether he really wanted to, basically. But um, he's there, he can stay there. We certainly want to win the election in 2020. What some of us feel and a bit worried about is if a decision has been made, you wait not till this election, but the one after that, and then you make the changes. Well, I don't agree with that. We try to win the next election. There are millions of our people out there that need to have a different policy to what we've got after we've seen with the tax credit. So basically, it's 2020. Now, if you're following a policy that's given up on 2020, I'm not very supportive of that kind of policy. Which means that we should probably be looking at a new Labour leader by the time the next election. Well, that's up around. to the party, but we do have rules that every year, even when I was in the job as the deputy, every year you could always have a claim against you. That's the party has that right. It's under certain circumstances. So we have to wait and see how it develops. The vote on uh, Monday is going to be a very important one, right? And we have to see exactly how we vote in that. 
Uh, let's talk about David Cameron now. He seems hell bent on war. Do we have war. to, like? <laughs> he seems hell bent on war. I'm interested to know uh, what you've got to say about it. You've been in a situation like this when there seems to be, uh, you know, a big will to go towards war. What's going on behind closed doors in government right now? Well, Cameron's on a me too. He has no influence internationally, has he? He goes over to the French, can I come with you? Goes over to the Americans, I'll bring you the two or three RAF planes we've got, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he just wants <laughs> to be centre stage, but he can't get Parliament to agree with him. Mm. Now we're going to see whether the policy actually has changed a little bit because the UN have come along and we passed a motion when we stopped the bombing into Syria was to say that the UN has to say enter into it and agree it. The UN has and no doubt lots of MPs are going to be thinking is that different when we took the vote before or the Commons did to stop go, uh, bombing Syria which Cameron wanted to do for the Americans. So Cameron goes around, I'll be with you governor, goes to the American president but can't carry through parliament. Shoots over to the French, I'm definitely going to with you but if I can get parliament. This is a man who wants to be a me too yeah. but he's not leading so anymore. He's making decisions on the basis else. of his ego and his profile oh, rather first. than conviction. Oh I what can be but listen, you know, conviction? I tell you what I'm always fascinated by when they get rushed into these meetings of Cobra, OK? Now, this is something... Well, I used to convene yeah, those yeah, when so we were in uh, you, you were in charge. Tony Blair was away in mm -hmm. 2005 right. when 7-7 seven, seven bombings took place. So you were the guy effectively in charge of the country in the Cobra meetings. Yep. What goes down there? How are decisions being made? What are the panic levels like? Well, of course, we're first told it was an explosion in the electric pop box or something on the underground. Eventually, then, we got the truth. It was an explosion inside, in the underground. It was also the matter of the bus that went off. What our first job is to do, and we convened the Cobra within minutes of the Cabinet meeting, and we then asked for the intelligence, what's happened, what can we do, how do we do with the emergency situation, and then how do we do with further security or if there are other people involved in it. And all the emergency services are there, the intelligence group, that's the one that deals with them. Cobra plays an important role in it. Um, so we've got to talk about the war that was taking place uh, during that era uh, that Tony Blair controversially led us into. What did you do to sort of try and temper you know, his, his seemingly relentless yeah. march towards that. Well, first of all, Parliament led us into it. It might have been that, but there was a vote in Parliament. Mm. We shouldn't ignore that. Based on intelligence, which I see they all use now, intelligence has told us, well, they told us, and they were quite wrong about it, right? So that's some lesson we should learn. But I was concerned with Tony because he goes away thinking he wants to invade these people. And I had to say to him when he keeps on about in these various countries that he wants to go in, I say to him, why don't you put a sheet on a Red Cross and start the bloody Crusades again? We lost that a thousand years ago, and that's precisely what we're doing at this present stage. Mm. It is almost a religious holy war, isn't it? Mm. And the Christians want to win over the Muslims. Hell, it gives you a hell of a thought. That's a thousand years ago, and we're back to it. Well, what about you saying that this intelligence, and there's still question marks over yeah. where that intelligence yeah. came from and why it was wrong, the Chilquot inquiry... Why is that taking so long? Well, Why agree. can't we know what happened? I gave evidence to the Chilcock Inquiry and I hope it would come out and show. Because what I was saying, basically, there cannot be regime change. Tony was almost... He said, it's not. He sent me over to America to talk to Cheney and that. But the Americans made clear they were going to go into in Iraq. So I came back to Tony and I said, listen, they're going in whether you're with them or not. Should be thinking about this. Is this regime change? And Tony kept saying, no, it isn't. That's not exactly what was said and we'll wait for Chilcock to the Americans. It was regime change and I don't think you have a right to do that to go in and change it. some of those sounds are coming up at the moment now isn't it? if I listen to Cameron today he's talking about well let's get rid of Assad right let's that's what we've got to do but then he finds that all divided in the coalition about whether you do that yeah and that's uh, really of course uh, the Russians are, are very pro Assad it's staying in place I mean you know what, what are the discussions around cabinet tables or, or in any other of this kind of senior levels of government when you know that a big, powerful country like Russia are uh, directly opposed to your own objectives? I think if that is the case and you can't get the coalition, you have to look then that the UN says it's got one. Within days of that happening, there's a Russian aeroplane being shot down. People are still at war. And now we're talking about backing the rebels in a civil war in Syria. It's a very difficult and complex. My view is, to be honest, I think you've got to get out of those areas. Mm. I know they say we'll use their troops now because we can't send our troops in. It's politically unacceptable in America and places like that. And now they say they're going to use the Iraqi army. Well, good luck. John, thanks for that. <laughs> this has been a great interview uh, so far. There's just one thing missing, and that is a large 
colourful wheel. So let's bring that on now, please. Um, this... Oh, it's a serious programme, is it? This is, very... <laughs> uh, this is dead serious, John. <laughs> um, as you can see on this wheel are a list of things that have played a part in your long and auspicious political career. And the rules of this game are, I spin it, whatever thing it lands on, you speak about. OK? You're not going back and thumping that fella again, are you? Well, let's see where the <laughs> wheel ends. Yeah. I'm not in charge. <laughs> the wheel is now in charge of this interview, John. Let's go. Uh, George W. Bush, is he as stupid as he seemed to be to the rest of us? He's very fearful. I did attend, I haven't said this before, a meeting, uh, one of the video link-ups with Tony. Mm. And Tony said to me, be careful and don't worry about the language, John, when I go in. And I thought, well, I swear a bit myself, you know. But <laughs> I knew what I meant when I got in there, because, Frank, Frank, he was talking about getting rid of the leader in Iraq, and I thought, Christ, he's like a gangster. Wow. And, and then you're saying to yourself, these are the ones that are ruling the world. George <laughs> Bush, for God's sake. Yeah. So he was potty-mouthed. And then I met Cheney, and he was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Cheney, they sent me to Cheney. I'm sitting in the White House, in his office, and he's on the video. Why? Could you remember they sent um, the, the, the president and the vice president, after they hit the terrible collection with the buildings, he was the man then. They all were hidden, weren't they? You know, they were hidden by the security service. Yeah. So he talked to me. I'm in his office. He's on the video. And he said, oh, sorry, Deputy Prime Minister, that I can't see you today. I'm in this place. I said, I'll tell you what, I bet it's more luxurious than the place that, that Bin Laden's in. <laughs> he didn't even smile. <laughs> <laughs> Miserable bastard, was he? he uh, well and, of was. course, you're from Hull and was a sailor, so it's hard to shock you with language, but those guys succeeded. Uh, let's spin the wheel again. Uh, Mandelson. Now, oh, Mandelson. Do we, next question. Yeah, you certainly in government. While well, I always thought it would be a fantastic premise for a sitcom about unlikely flatmates, Mandelson and Preza. Did you always? Uh, were you always at loggerheads? I never liked him. He's too smart for his own good, really. But he's done very well from his point of view. But I employed him at one stage for a man called Albert Booth, and we employed him to be our researcher uh, to do it on transport. He couldn't write the report, so I was always amazed that he kept. Get, got to the position he did. Did you ever but regret... All because of the Red Rose. We're talking yeah. about the Red... But what about the ruddy Red Rose that Manderson pushed on us all at the time? Oh, it's a lovely rose, although I always felt... I love roses, rather too but long. why turn it into the political situation? I didn't want that. Anyway, look, he's a, he's a very able guy. He's not my kind of guy. And it always comes up, him and I, that I was on the Thames showing how clean the water was, and there was a crab in a glass, right? And what I was saying, I said hello, Peter, because he was running for the executive. <laughs> and there are incidents in politics that come up, and that was the one that was with Manderson. And he's still in there now, isn't he? About. Right. <laughs> Let's have another spin. Uh, commoners, now, you know, you're uh, from a working-class background. Um, did it ever feel, during the new Labour years, that you were the guy who they wheeled out to prove that the Labour Party still had roots in, you know, in the working classes, um, rather like those racists who claim they've got black mates. <laughs> class is middle class. Do you say class like working class? I say class myself because yeah. I've got a southern accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the south. Yeah. No, in regard to commoners, I, I remember having a discussion with... Um, John Humphreys on the Today programme, and he was yeah. saying, the middle class are joining the Labour Party. He said, they've always been in the Labour Party. He said, well, you as working class, don't you object? No, I'm middle class. How can I run around with two jags that you put on me, one belong to the government and not me, and I don't <laughs> live working class. I know what working class is living. And I thought to that extent, so I said, yes, I'm middle class, I accept that, and they played a part. They got my mum and dad to go on the Today programme with Humphreys <laughs> and disown me, <laughs> saying, well, we're still working Class, what's that bugger on about? You know, but they were furious about it, Mr. and Mrs. Prescott. Oh, they were annoyed. They went on the program and disowned me. Uh, let's have another spin. Uh, the Queen. Uh, how'd you get on with the Queen? I'll have to show you this one. Oh, the you. Queen. Steady on, John. Steady on. She's very small, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not a monarchist, right? Right. She was coming to Hull, and I said I didn't really <laughs> want to meet her. Yeah. Not want to be offensive, a lot of people think it's a very important part of us, and I, I, I don't want to insult that. So I said I won't come. My party then said to me up in Hull, you've got to come, because you're only meeting the three MPs, and we want you there. Uh, I said, OK, but I won't bow, because I don't bow. 
Right. So anyway, she gets out of the car, my mother, my wife, because she was almost doing the bow for about three weeks to get it right, you know. <laughs> but she came along and she was so small, I didn't realise up to about that. Tiny. So she came to me and I my wife did a curtsy job. I just shook her hands to be polite and stood up straight. And she looked at me and she said, oh, no, three. I said, pardon? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's Amazing. a very smart lady. That's a trick. <laughs> she knows what she... The Queen is not playing games. And my party said, you did bow then. Yeah. No, I was being polite. No, she no, made no, a no. fool of you. Right, let's have another spin. <laughs> oh, bus lanes. How pissed off was Jeremy Clarkson when you stuck a bus lane on the M4? He was always pissed off, wasn't he? Yeah. Clarkson. But anyway, leaving that aside. What I did on, on the... Uh, funny enough, I always refused to go on his programme. I think he's an arrogant beggar. So... This time, he wanted to bring up the question of the extra bus lane that I put on the M4, right? And there are three routes there, right? Then it goes down to two. So I said, look, make it a bus lane fast, and then instead of getting the crowds you get, the, some of them dash out into the third lane, make it two for cars, one for the buses. All the evidence was there were less accidents, it was quicker coming, all done by the police, right? And he said, I want to argue on the programme with you. I went on the programme, but... Uh, I, I made my case, he made his, and I had to say to him, can you shut your mouth, engage your brain, <laughs> and I'll give you a very important lesson that you can go slower and get there quicker. I know it's a bit much for you to think about that, but that's true. That's flow characteristics. That's, that's okay. bus lanes. OK, last spin of the wheel. Let's see, could land anywhere. Whoa, look at that. Punching a Welshman. Hey! You stopped him, I saw that. Oh, that was a random spin, John. Um, that Welshman you punched. Uh, how much of a bollocking did Tony Blair give you on that day? He didn't, actually, to be fair. What happened was this incident occurred, right? The fellow, big as a bloody barn door. I'm going past him. I've got a feeling he's going to hit me. And then he hit me with the, the egg, and I didn't know it was an egg. It was warm, and I thought it was in blood, so I disagreed with him. Tony Blair rings me up and says, uh, John, what happened? I said, well, the guy belted me. You know, I just disagreed with him. He said, why? So Tony Blair was coming out of television studio and he said to Alistair Campbell, what happened there? He said, he said, what a terrible day. Everything went wrong on that manifesto. You know, he got shouted at, didn't he, Jack? Yeah. He got jeered. And he headed in and he says, terrible. Nothing else can happen. And, um, Jack, and uh, Aust um, Alistair. Alistair said to him, Oh, I'm sorry, John's just thumped a fella up in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he said, the fella thumped John. And I, he said, no, no, John thumped the fella. And he said, did anybody see it? <laughs> <laughs> Live television. <laughs> so all that goes on. He rings me. He said, you all right? I said, yeah. Um, why did you do it? I said, was carrying out your orders. I said, what do you mean? Well, when you sent us off to tell everybody, you told us to connect with the electorate, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great punch, John, wasn't it? Let's be honest. It was, a, it was a great punch, and when you look back at those clips, you must feel proud of the way you connected. You know when it started? Huh. Have you ever heard of a Prime Minister called um, Anton Eden? Yeah, oh, yeah. When he resigned of the Suez, he went on a ship to New Zealand. Yeah. I was his waiter. And one of the first boxing matches it was boxing for the passengers on that ship, the Rangatata, for which I got two bottles of beer. And look how the skill helped me later on in my wow, life. Wow, so you've punched someone's face in front of not one, but two prime ministers. <laughs> yeah, <that's Yeah>. right. <laughs> you know, but you asked how Tony Blair dealt with it. He's quite smart, didn't he? He said, what are you going to do about it? Some of the women in the party wanted me done, macho type, shouldn't be done for people, you know, yeah. the usual thing you get from the sisters sometimes. Fair so, enough. What well, well, Blair then said, he, uh, uh, press asked him, he's going to get rid of him. And, then, and Blair said, well, John's John. And yeah. you know who organised all that? Sky. And that Adam Bolton and all them. You know they had that business about saying, it first happened on Sky, or you first learnt about yeah. it. And that's what they did, because Sky got the television. If you look at the shots, I'm walking past, and I just hit this fellow in the face like. But they waited till the BBC came on, and it saw that the fellow hit me first. But, of course, you saw it first on Sky. Yeah. So I've always accused him of being bloody party to it. What do you expect from a Murdoch outfit? <laughs> <laughs> well said, John. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Fantastic to have you here. John Prescott, what an honour. And that's all we've got time for.